presiding officer, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this debate, and I'm very grateful to the government for the conciliatory tone they have attempted to foster. The only other time I remember having occasion to speak about an ethical approach to foreign policy was at an Amnesty International conference in 1999, where a new Labour MP was trying to extol the virtues of the ethical approach to foreign policy adopted by the Blair administration. But this was just weeks after Police Commissioner Paul Condon, on the behest of the Home Office, had stifled peaceful demonstrations around a Chinese state visit to the UK. My remarks in that debate followed a course that I shall attempt to chart again this afternoon around one basic precept, and that is this. It is our duty, as a developed and progressive democracy, to walk softly through the lives of other nations, to share in the benefits of de-restricted and mutually beneficial commerce, but to do so without making ourselves either complicit in or silent witness to the abuse of human rights in those places. So I welcome the opportunity to, be, to debate this today, and I'm particularly interested in the design and in the use of the government's list of priority countries. Because, presiding officer, there have been lists like this before, yet they haven't always encumbered Scottish ministers in dealing with countries adrift of those lists, and sometimes even in those adrift of those values and re for respect and human rights shared by all of the parties in this chamber. Similarly, these lists themselves have sometimes caused mild controversies in the past, like the time, for example, when in 2013, the Scottish Government included Kurdistan in a new list of countries where it was seeking to work. On further questioning, the Government were reluctant to disclose whether it had discussed the statehood of Kurdistan with other potential trading partners like Turkey or Albania. So a list is welcome, but it needs to be transparent. We need to stick to it, and it needs to be diplomatically coherent. This should in turn be underpinned by clear protocols for how government agencies should work in countries which have human rights concerns attached to them. In accepting this approach, presiding officer, we must be absolutely clear around what standards we expect countries to meet before we consider working with them as partners. For instance, in respect of emerging economies, what political or human rights hurdles would we expect Indonesia to clear, or for that matter, any of the next wave of global economic superpowers in the tier below the BRICS countries before they could be added to the Scottish Government's list for doing business? I'd be very grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could address that in her remarks and set out the thresholds she expects such countries to clear. It's important that we hammer this out because this country and indeed this government have at times fallen short of the due diligence around human rights before. And we used our time in this chamber last year to debate the supposed £10 billion memorandum of understanding that the government rushed to sign between Sino Fortone and China Railways No. 3, irrespective of the serious concerns from Norway and, and many others about the way in which human rights had been abused and sidelined mm. by CR3 in earlier projects. And this eagerness to further relations with China was evident in the refusal by Alex Salmond to meet the Dalai Lama on his last visit of Edinburgh, which was an embarrassing failure to recognize and support the efforts of those battling oppression by the Chinese state. Now, this government also fell short in its dealings with Qatar, despite revelations about human, the human rights situation there, not least surrounding the World Cup. Indeed, in 2013, my Lib Dem colleagues raised the concerns about the imprisonment of Qatari poet Mohammed al-Ajami, uh, who wrote verses criticizing the head of the Qatar government and was in turn sentenced to 15 years in prison as a result. His case was not pressed by Scottish ministers in their mission to Qatar. It may be that the right opportunity was not forthcoming on that visit, but the ministerial delegation to the neighboring Abu Dhabi Poetry Festival on the same trip must surely have provided such a chance. I will. Fiona Hislop, uh, we press human rights issues on a number of, of our meetings when we can to make sure we have uh, the influence that uh, Amnesty International, that was referred to by the member, advises that you do. But there can sometimes be a dilemma because you're sometimes trying to help countries that have got human rights issues to try and change their approach. And some of the issues can be close to home. For example, in international development, some of the countries that we work with may not have the level of human rights adherence that he may wish to see, but nevertheless, we need to work with them to help that journey. And every country, even this, this, this country, has been on a journey. So how do you square some of the challenges there in relation to the human rights? 
We are pushed for time, Mr. Grateful Hamilton. for the intervention. I absolutely accept that such a dilemma exists, uh, but to this end, the second clause of our amendment calls for ministers to undertake a level of diligence that pre perhaps previously has not existed, both in dealings with companies and state parties, to ensure that we understand the human rights environment in which, into which we are going. Even though I don't, suppose, I don't for a minute suggest we should send those uh, countries to isolation, we should try to embrace and try to bring them to a standard of human rights uh, observance that we would, we would see fit. And there are also further tests of our muscle ahead too in the nature of our long-standing relationship with the US uh, and how we respond to the ethical bankruptcy of the Trump administration. I hope that the ministers, as they go forward to Tartan Week, will reflect on the discussions that we have and the, uh, expressing our concerns to our colleagues overseas. Finally, presiding officer, yes, as I said please. at the top of my remarks, um, it is in all our international dealings, we have to walk softly through the lives of other nations. As such, I move the amendment in my name.